Okay, so it's not my pleasure now, we'll get the, the panel started, but it's my pleasure first to introduce uh, Allison Dirk. Did I get that right yet? Okay, good, good. She serves as the director of the Eugene V. Debs Museum uh, since uh, 2016. Uh, it was originally built in 1890, and it's where Debs lived in Terre Haute, his Indiana home. Uh, Allison's current work at the museum f uh, focuses on Debs' relevance to contemporary working class movements. Uh, she was raised in a union family in rural northern Indiana. Allison relocated to Terre Haute in 2012 to attend Indiana State University, where she earned a BS in political science. While attending Indiana State, she researched labor legislation, was active, an active student organizer. She serves as the social action committee uh, on the social action committee at the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Terre Haute. Uh, let's welcome Allison. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to Andrew and Tom Sauters for the invitation to come speak today, to LEAP and all the organizers of this weekend's events. Um, and I'm so excited to talk today about the Eugene B. Debs Museum over in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is, yes, the historic home of Jean and Kate Debs. In this talk, I will give a brief history of the Debs home, the nonprofit foundation that organized to save it, and I'll discuss why Debs and his house are relevant today and how you can get involved if you support our mission. Many of you know quite well that Debs was born in 1855 to French immigrants in a little shack of a house on 4th Street in Terre Haute. Jean called the Queen City of the Wabash his home until his death in 1926. After a year-long engagement to Kate Metzel, the two married in 1885. They built their home five years later in 1890. That's the oldest available photograph that we have of the house. Sorry for the quality there. Um, but that was at the same time that Debs was serving as the Grand Secretary Treasurer of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen. Jean and Kate chose to build on a double lot on North 8th Street, which at the time was a desirable residential area of the growing city with close proximity to Union Station. And the bustling railroad depot was only a few blocks northeast of the home, which made for a conveniently brief walk for Jean and Kate, both frequent travelers. Now the house itself uh, was and is a Victorian wood frame residence, originally with slate gray cedar bevel lap siding and some red accents and ornamentation. Biographer Ray Ginger, who wrote The Bending Cross, described the house as both conventional and also disjointed, substantial, and ugly, with gables that seem to burgeon unbidden from other gables. I'll let you decide what you think. <laughs> um, but Ginger wrote that Eugene himself drew up the plans for the home, uh, but that's pretty unlikely. The house was actually designed by Merrill J. Sherman, a noted local architect. Now today's museum visitors can still see the house's seven ceramic tile fireplaces and original fine woodwork on the mantles, pocket doors, staircases, and built-in bookcases. Uh, with two and a half stories plus a large root cellar, Kate described the home as comfortably sized or large enough for the many children with whom she and Kate intended to fill the home. Unfortunately, the two were never able to have children, a source of grief for the young couple. Jean, on one hand, was able to find familial connection in the movement that he led, but Kate, on the other hand, had a more private and reserved personality. She, did, she was able to build her own kind of family experience in the home, raising her nephew, as well as caring for her aging grandfather and mother at the house. Uh, and that was actually the catalyst for a minor architect architectural change to the home, because in 1916, when Catherine Bauer, Kate's mother, moved into the house, the original decorated wood porch that you see here had decayed beyond repair, with the floor, with the floor practically falling in. Now Catherine, Kate's mother, at the time was ill and almost entirely blind, so Jean and Kate replaced the original wood porch with the brick and concrete that remains on the house today. Now, in true Victorian fashion, the porch of the Debs home offered an additional living space that was closer to nature without ever leaving the comforts of home. Porches like Jean and Kate's came into fashion and during, the, during the Victorian era, and besides providing an attractive area for leisure or entertaining guests, the porch of the Debs home uh, played an iconic role at the end of Eugene Debs' life. On October 20th, 1926, Jean passed away after enduring a heart attack at the Lindlar Sanitarium in Elmhurst, Illinois, where he actually met with Carl Sandburg, as an aside. His body arrived back in Terre Haute by train, fitting, and laid in state at one of the city's labor temples. 5,000 mourners gathered at the home at 451 North 8th Street for Deb's funeral service. His comrades Norman Thomas, Seymour Stedman, Morris Hillquit, and Victor Berger all delivered eulogies from the porch of the home. Kate remained in the house for the rest of her life until her death in 1936. 
Of course, the Debs Museum we know today did not immediately materialize. Instead, the house saw a pretty unique handful of owners and residents through the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s. The first included the family of Dr. John Shannon, a professor of history at what was then the Indiana State Teachers College, now Indiana State University. Now, for over a decade, 451 North 8th was also home to Theta Chi fraternity, and, and yeah, it's still standing. Uh, the students used the first two floors for socializing and studying. The attic of the house provided sleeping quarters or a cold air dorm, and possibly used the basement for initiation rituals. I try not to wonder too much what was going on. Um, the fraternity brothers covered the original clabbered siding with the cedar shingles that you see here and affixed their block letters to the house. Now, when I give tours of the museum and share this chapter of the house's history, visitors tend to flinch a little, and I get it. I can't really comment on the behavior of the fraternity brothers or their treatment of the house, but I do like to think that perhaps they embodied the fraternal spirit that characterized Deb's own life and work. It's something, I guess. <laughs> now, early in 1962, local contractor William Heck purchased the home and began work converting it into several small apartments. Around the same time, Indiana State University was quickly expanding its campus into the neighborhood surrounding 451 North 8th. All of the similar Victorian homes that once lined the street have since been cleared for parking lots, classroom and dormitory buildings, and of course, green space. Now, without any protective status or owners interested in the home's preservation, the house of Jean and Kate likely would have faced a similar fate. Thankfully, that was never the case. And actually, in this photo that you see here, the two kind of towering scary buildings behind the house were um, originally built as dormitories converted into the Colleges of Business and Education at Indiana State and have since been torn down. That was in like uh, 2014 or so. Uh, so in winter of 1962, a handful of Indiana State University faculty members met with Tilford Dudley, who was at the time the director of the Speakers Bureau of the National AFL-CIO. They met in Stalker Hall on the campus of Indiana State to discuss the possibility of purchasing the Debs home for use as a memorial. After drawing up articles of incorporation for a new nonprofit, the Eugene V. Debs Foundation, and after negotiating a purchase price of $9,000 from Heck, the founders set to work soliciting donations from their colleagues in academic, labor, and socialist circles. By the spring of 1962, after only a few short months, 63 individuals donated $100 each to secure their status as charter members of the Eugene V. Debs Foundation. Now today, I know $100 might not seem like that much money, but adjusted for inflation, it amounts to over $800 in 2018 money. And you can fact check that, it's true. So according to Professor J. Robert Constantine, you might know him as Bob Constantine, who was one of a handful that attended that first meeting in Stalker Hall, these 63 charter members represented an, quote, alliance of Indiana State University faculty, organized labor representatives, and a mixed group of men and women who shared Debsian ideals. The members ranged from eager college students to retired workers. And while each of the charter members made their own unique contributions, a few standouts would include Norman Thomas, Roger Baldwin, and Upton Sinclair. Louis Mayer, another founder of Note, sculpted the most iconic bust of Debs, that you see here, located in the library of the Debs house today. Incidentally, Debs sat with Lewis Mayer for the initial carving of that bust in between sessions of his trial here in Cleveland 100 years ago, and an additional casting of that bust is housed at, in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Now, I also couldn't come all the way to Cleveland without mentioning another um, really interesting charter member, Clyde Miller, who was the journalist and key prosecution witness against Debs at his Cleveland trial, who later, long story short, decided that Debs had been right all along about the First World War. Another particularly interesting charter member was Professor Eugene Dykey, chair of the Department of Philosophy at Indiana State. And if his last name sounds familiar, that's because his father, Ed Dykey, was the warden at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary while Debs was in prison there following his conviction for violating the Espionage Act 100 years ago. Now, the hostile political climate central to Debs' later life continued after his death and into the Foundation's early years. And this was particularly true for Eugene's niece, Marguerite Debs Cooper. Marguerite faced harassment and nearly lost her position as a schoolteacher in Terre Haute for being from a, quote, red family. 
After some understandable hesitation, Marguerite became one of the most enthusiastic charter members, donating family effects to the museum's collection, giving her uncle's and father's letters to establish the Debs Collection at Indiana State University, housed in the Special Collections Department, and endowing the Debs Fellowship at Indiana State, which is for a graduate history student studying labor history or social movements. A great way for a family's legacy to live on outside of the museum. Now, in the 50th anniversary edition of the Debs Foundation newsletter, which I hope you pick up the current edition that's out on the table today, uh, former, former Foundation Secretary Charles King noted that, quote, McCarthyism definitely was not dead in the conservative Terre Haute community and in Indiana. Looking back, it is amazing that there were enough men and women of sufficient awareness of history and Deb's considerable contributions to society and sufficiently progressive in their personal commitments that they could come together, found a society for historical preservation and education, and could succeed these 50 years to preserve a unique historical site and a great legacy. And that I think they did. After extensive renovations, including the addition of white vinyl siding that remains on the house today, not my personal favorite, the Debs Foundation dedicated and opened the museum in 1965. Pictured here are Ned Bush, the museum's first curator and caretaker, Marguerite Debs Cooper in the middle, who, Eugene's niece, of course, the daughter of Theodore Debs, Eugene's closest friend and campaign manager, and also Norman Thomas uh, at the dedication of the home in 1965. A year later, the National, Park the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior declared the home a National Historic Landmark, and we remain Vigo County's only National Historic Landmark today. In 1979, board member and prolific local artist John L. Laska completed his work on the murals that cover the attic walls today. Dr. Laska was also an artist in residence at Indiana State, where he taught art education, briefly taught art in um, the local public schools, and was obviously a huge fan of Debs to spend three years of his life completing these murals. And thanks to these murals, the attic remains the most popular area of the house when I give tours. Today, the Debs Museum attracts visitors from across the country and around the globe. Our admission is still free, and our Tuesday through Saturday hours include two evenings a week to accommodate visitors who might need to work during conventional museum hours. The vast majority of our museum guests participate in a full guided tour of the Debs home. And admittedly, this is not a typical historic house museum with very strict attention paid to accurate period interiors. In fact, much of the house features 60s era wallpaper and some very attractive wood paneling that you can see here too. Um, and that's okay with me. There isn't too much sense in trying to pretend that the house has been sitting pristine, untouched, and unused since Jean and Kay opened it in, or built it in 1890. Now, we are fortunate to have a considerable amount of Jean and Kate's original furniture, personal possessions, and political memorabilia on display in the house. Pictured here is the original parlor suite to the home, which was actually a gift, a wedding gift from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen to Jean and Kate in 1885. They needed a house to put their stuff in. Uh, but we also don't attempt to hide, for example, our telephone or our wireless internet router. The point of the Debs Museum is not to take that proverbial step back in time, but rather to encourage our guests to use historical thinking and grapple with the ways that Deb's life and legacy are relevant today. One of the Foundation's core programs underscoring Deb's contemporary relevance is our annual award banquet. Each year since 1965, the Foundation's board of directors selects an individual or organization working in Deb's legacy of labor rights or social justice and hosts a banquet in that person's honor. It's worth noting that the award recipient, as a rule, accepts the award in person as the banquet is the foundation's largest fundraiser and is literally what keeps our doors open today. Past award recipients have included Norman Thomas, Michael Harrington, Coretta Scott King, Pete Seeger, Dorothy Day, Jesse Jackson, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, kind of a laundry list for the movement, you know. Um, a. Philip Randolph, Walter Ruther, others include Howard Zinn, Molly Ivins, um, Studs Terkel, Cindy Sheehan, two years ago, and my personal favorite recipient, I love to say, is Kurt Vonnegut, of course, another notable Hoosier hero for us. Um, pictured here is actually Sarita Gupta, Executive Director of Jobs with Justice, accepting the 2017 Debs Award on behalf of the national organization, Jobs with Justice. In just a few short weeks, we will present the 2018 Debs Award to William or Bill Lucy, a retired National Secretary of AFSCME and organizer of the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike 50 years ago this year. 
Compared to similar award banquets, I have to say ours remains quite affordable, that's intentional, and I invite you and your organizations to consider attending this year's banquet on October 20th. I just found out that, of course, there are still tickets available, but they're going fast, so if you want to order some, please do. Ticket information is available on our website, debsfoundation.org, and the foundation does accept and fully consider public nominations for award recipients, so if anybody comes to mind, please send your nomination our way. Another of our most meaningful programs that I was proud to help organize was our own centennial commemoration at the museum this past summer. On June 16, exactly 100 years to the day after Debs delivered his most consequential speech in Canton, Ohio, June of 1918, the Debs Foundation and its supporters gathered at the home for a public reading of the Canton speech in its entirety. And I'm, I'm sure some of us in this room have read the entire work, and if you do, you'll know it's pretty lengthy. So rather than rely on a single speaker or reenactor to portray Debs and deliver the entire speech, we split it up into a couple dozen five-minute sections and invited guests to read their portions in succession, not to unlike the reading on the steps of the courthouse yesterday afternoon some of us I know were at. And naturally, we conducted the reading from the porch of the Debs house. We called the event Debs in Our Voices, and hearing the century-old words read by my colleagues, friends, and comrades of wildly varying political tendencies truly affirmed Debs' meaning and relevance today. Now, I think that most of us in this room would agree that the working class movement led by Debs has at least some kind of value in 2018, particularly in contemporary areas of workers' rights, economic democracy, freedom of speech, mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex, and endless war. But naturally, not every guest at the museum is entirely sympathetic to Debs' worldview. So rather than attempt to fundamentally change every hesitant visitor's mind, I try to build and find the common ground that's usually there. But it turns out that sharing working class history is a powerful tool for building those connections. Most visitors, regardless of their politics, can find some agreement with Debs on the general shortcomings of the two dominant political parties and their inability to, to address the needs of working people. At the very least, most every visitor that I've worked with can agree that Debs represents an important part of American history and that his story is worth telling today. Now, when Tom initially asked me to present at this centennial conference on the topic of the Debs Foundation and Museum, I have to admit that I was tempted to fall into habit and bring a little bit of Terre Haute over to Cleveland and try to give you all a virtual tour of the house. We didn't do that. For better or for worse, that will have to wait until you can actually make the trip to Vigo County and see the house in person. We're only about an hour west of Indianapolis along I-70. It's a pretty convenient drive. So I personally invite each of you to do so, and I look forward to your visits. To plan one, again, please utilize the information on our website, debsfoundation.org, or just come chat with me. And now I know I am in a room with a handful of experts in here, so I welcome guest speakers to give presentations and lectures at the museum. This, that kind of programming is really important to our mission. And pictured here is the current Debs Foundation Secretary, Michelle Moran, presenting her really great research on Kate Debs in the parlor of the Debs home. Also, of course, Ernie has been another guest speaker at the house about a year and a half ago. This is honestly a really exciting time at the museum. Our visitor attendance is steadily increasing, our programs are improving, and guided house tours are more comprehensive and inclusive. We're currently wrapping up a condition assessment on the house, which is the first phase of what will be an extensive multi-year restoration and renovation project on the building. If you've seen it, you know it needs it. Um, but our newest museum program is a study group that meets monthly to discuss Deb's writings in his own library. We're hosting events like rallies on International Women's Day, which you see here, um, with emphasis on the day's working class socialist origins. In the wake of recent school shootings, Terre Haute students organizing for gun violence prevention have found their unofficial base in the Debs House, using our space for their meetings and events. I see more and more young people, disenchanted with politics as usual, gravitating toward Debs' ideas, rejecting capitalism, and embracing critical dissent. We have some real momentum right now, but the programs and projects like the ones I'm describing need your support. I invite you to contribute to the Debs Foundation by possibly attending our annual award banquet this year or in the future, or our other events, <coughs> ordering merch from our online memorabilia shop, signing up to receive our newsletter, or even joining the board of directors. Of course, you can simply use the handy donation tool on our website, and with your support, the Debs Foundation will continue to preserve and further the Debs legacy. Thank you very much today.